appreciate that. And uh, John, your timing was impeccable. Thank you for being here right on time. And we're looking forward to your talk, which I hear is quite informative on how to protect yourself on the phone from uh, Zoom, uh, unwanted calls. Let's put it that from, from robo calls. Robo, robo, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'll turn it over to you, John. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, folks. Uh, is it uh, official scheduled start time was three o'clock? Is it okay to start early? Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, you've got a good crowd here today. I I must say that I have spent a lot of time in your neighborhood over the past few decades. Um, I photographed uh, one Apollo launch and three shuttle launches. Uh, one of my best friends from college grew up in Orlando in, in uh, Winter Park. And I've uh, visited uh, with his family many times. Um, okay, give me a moment here. I'm going to start the uh, slideshow. And <clears throat> let's see here. Okay. so. Let me get back to the Zoom meeting. Now, when I start the show, the first thing you're going to see is a black slide. Do not panic. That is exactly what you should see. And I'll advance from that to the title slide. All right, here we go. OK, now I'm going to do a couple of things to make sure that the stuff on my screen does not block your view of the slides. And I gotta hide the, let's see here. Hide floating meeting controls, there we go. Okay, now, well, all right. Um, we're I have seeing, shortened. We're seeing one black box at the, just right. Yep. On the Let me get rid of that because that is reminding me that uh, closed captioning has been enabled. I'll get rid of that. There we go. I, I hope that improved things for you. Yes, there are no, none on the screen now. Okay. So um, this is sort of a preamble. I uh, normally, uh, with groups that I'm speaking with for the first time, I teach them how to scan QR codes with their smartphones. Um, I'm not going to do that today. There is a presentation on YouTube uh, that was uh, rec uh, recording made by the APCUG organization of my presentation for them on the subject of QR codes. And that will teach you how to use your phone to scan QR codes. Um, I'm going to show you the link in a minute so you can find that YouTube uh, video. Uh, the advantage of having QR codes in a presentation is almost inevitably presentations point you to uh, uh, either a web page from which you can get more information or a web page from which you can download an application that you may need. And I have uh, not only that, I have QR codes in my presentation that will help you download an application for your phone that will help you make audio recordings. Uh, the ad real advantage of QR codes is that you can access the information very quickly without typing a lengthy URL, and very importantly, without making typos. We've all had that experience of trying to type a URL, and it gives us what's called a 404 code, which means uh, file not found. And then we have to go back and debug what we typed. Uh, QR codes eliminate that issue. And uh, certainly the longer the URL, the greater the advantage of QR codes for this purpose. Um, so if you have any of these versions of Android on your phone, 10 or 11 or 12, or iOS, any of the versions 11 through 15, your phone already has that capability to scan QR codes. It might not be enabled, you have to use the settings app to confirm that it is enabled in the case of iOS and the settings app, the settings within the camera app itself in the case of Android. Um, 
and the app will scan the QR code as soon as it sees the QR code. You don't even need to tap the shutter button. So it's a very convenient way to take advantage of information that people uh, provide in uh, presentations like this one. Um, now, uh, as I said, I am not going to teach you that today because uh, Stan requested that I shorten the presentation. So I've shown you the URL here at the bottom of the page. And what I suggest you do is uh, either take a picture of this page with your phone or do a screen save. And you can do that by holding down the Windows key and tapping print screen. That combination means that you actually store the screen capture, which print screen normally does, uh, in a file. And that file will be located in Windows in the pictures slash screenshots folder. So that's a quick way to make notes like this while you are viewing a presentation. You can uh, Windows print screen, will actually save it to your, your local uh, drive, whether it's a hard drive or a solid state drive. Um, and that's what this file, that's what this slide is about. I've, I preempted my own slide. Um, and uh, so that's the second way to, uh, store all that stuff. Now we're on another blank screen because we're about to start the main presentation. And here it goes. It's called Complete Robocall Defense. Um, and this is probably the longest one of the many things that I uh, deliver as presentations for computer clubs. Uh, I, I, told, I, I told Stan when he booked me that this was uh, about two hours. I actually presented it in three separate parts originally for my computer group here in Northern Virginia, the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society. Um, so uh, the latest thing I did uh, in updating this was uh, introduce the latest version of Audacity. The reason is it makes it much simpler to do audio editing. And you're going to see that happen step by step in this presentation. So even if you have never had an interest in recording audio or editing audio, you'll learn how to do it today. And the reason is because it has an advantage for deterring robocalls, as you'll learn. All right, we're, I'm going to give you basically a single slide discussing the scale of the robocall problem. And I think you'll be very interested, interested to see just how nasty it is these days. Uh, we'll talk about sort of the personal viewpoint, how robocalls impact you. Uh, and that will have, help us establish the goals of robocall defense. Uh, we're going to look at some past methods to deter robocalls, one of which you can still use on your landline if you have one. Uh, we'll talk about why uh, do not call.gov and uh, blacklist oriented uh, robocall uh, blocking systems do not work anymore. And then we'll find out how to use your contacts as what's called a whitelist. A whitelist means a list of people who are allowed to call you. There is a system on your uh, personal cell phone called Do Not Disturb, and it allows you to use your contacts as exceptions. In other words, if, if a call is coming in from a contact, your phone will ring. If your, a call is coming in from anywhere else, your phone will not ring. And we'll see how to make that work on your Android phone or your iPhone step by step. And finally, how to prevent robocall voicemails. This was a very significant problem for me because I, I was getting so many that I had to clean out my voicemail inbox twice a week. Uh, and it's now gotten to the point where it's once every three or four months. All right. So first of all, the scale of the robocall problem. And this, this goes back to uh, an estimate published in the Washington Post back in March of 2019. And they estimated in the month of March, 
there were 5.2 billion with a B robocalls placed. And as it turns out, that was reported in the month of April, April based on statistics from March. And I happened to figure out that March included 2.6 million seconds. So if we divide that number 5.2 billion by the number of seconds, what do we get? We get about 2,000, and that's the number of robocalls placed per second. So you can get the idea. This is a huge problem now, not just for you and, and I, but for everyone else who has a smartphone. And in many cases, for people who have landlines. And what are the nature of those impacts on you? Well, first of all, uh, when a robocall is ringing your phone, you're going to see a caller ID that is either unknown. In other words, the word unknown shows up on your phone or it'll be something that's unfamiliar to you. Um, I have seen this happen a lot on my phone. Uh, the displayed number may be in your own area code. And even your own area code and the next three digits, which are called the exchange. And that all of that is intended to suggest falsely that a neighbor is calling. And that turns out that's a technique used widely by robocallers. Uh, and in a few cases, people have reported that they received a robocall from someone actually claiming to be their own self. In other words, the number displayed as the calling number was your own phone number. Now, I might say that is an extreme case. And folks, if you ever see that as an incoming call on your smartphone, please be smart enough to recognize that can't happen. So it has to be a robocaller and don't answer it. Um, and I mentioned this previously, that robocalls often leave voicemails and they frequently clog your voicemail inbox. Uh, inboxes are, are actually saved on servers by your carrier company, such as AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon. Uh, and because they're saved there, they don't give you much room to save voicemails. So as a result, your voicemail inbox is loaded up to its limit and people you want to hear from cannot leave a voicemail for you until you clean out your voicemail inbox. And like I said, I had to do that twice a week back in 2018. Um, now, if you do answer a robocall, there are various techniques. Um, and this is not technology, this is psychology. Um, there's various techniques they use to try to talk you out of something that allows them to take your money. And the first thing is they often demand an urgent reply. I can remember back at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2019, literally the day that the government told all of us who worked for the government here in Washington that we would have to work from home indefinitely. That same day, I got a robocall insisting that my electric company had terminated my account for non-payment and asked me urgently to call them in order to reestablish my account. What they wanted me to do is pay in a whole bunch of money. And I knew that my account was current. I had paid it automatically every month out of my checking account. So I knew this urgent demand wasn't coming from my electric company. It was coming from a scam artist via a robocall. And that urgency is the first thing you should notice. The second thing is they may falsely suggest they are from the government. They may not literally say that, but they may ask you to confirm your social. And that is a pretty clear indication that it's a robocall uh, that if somebody's trying to take money from you, they want to know your social security number so they can uh, convince your bank that uh, they are you so that they can take the money out of your bank account. 
Um, and there's even been reports that people falsely file uh, tax returns so they can get a big refund from the IRS out of your refund so that when you apply, you're told by the IRS, hey, you can't be you because somebody else has already taken that money. So you want to really stay away from giving any personal information to anybody who calls and suggests it's an urgent need to confirm any information about you, such as your bank account, your social security number, your date of birth. You don't want to ever give that out to any unknown caller. Uh, other things that they do, uh, they open store credit accounts in your name. If they have the three key things, your name, your social security number, and your date of birth, often they can open store credit accounts in your name. And typically what they do is buy something big like a refrigerator uh, or a very expensive television set, and they don't pay, and they ruin your credit score as a result because it's under your social security number. So you want to uh, definitely stay away from these callers. So what are the, as a result of understanding all that, what do we want to accomplish in robocall defense? I think the very first thing, and this turns out to be not terribly difficult, is to prevent robocalls from ringing your phone. And we can do that pretty easily using the whitelist approach that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's a little more difficult, and this will be in the second half of the presentation, to convince uh, robocallers not to leave voicemails for you. And basically what we'll do is convince them falsely that your number has been disconnected. And that same technique, by convincing them that your number is disconnected, will also convince robocall systems not to call your number again. Because for them, it's a waste of time to call a number that they all already believe to be not in service. Finally, you will learn a lot of jargon in this presentation, and you can convince your family and friends that you are an expert in this field. Okay, um, now we're going to look at sort of the history that of past methods to deter robocalls. And this is the, the thing that got it all started. Uh, this is a device called a telezapper. And I first purchased one of these in the 1990s, actually before I ever had a cell phone. And this was used when uh, connected to landlines to prevent robocallers from disrupting your day or your evening. Essentially, all it did was play three tones. Those things are known as the special information tones or SIT. And they were the preface for every automated a uh, message from the phone company telling you that you had dialed a number that doesn't exist or that the line you had dialed is disconnected or not in service. Those three tones are what the automated robocall systems listen for. And when they hear them, they say, oh, this number has been disconnected. It's not true. But on the other hand, there's almost nothing that robocalls tell you that is true. They're lying to you, so why not use Telezapper to lie to them? It's justice, in my opinion. Um, back when uh, robocallers typically called at the dinner hour, we enabled this on our landline here at my house uh, to uh, convince the robocallers that our line doesn't exist anymore. And as a result, it radically cut down on the number of people who called at dinner time because they thought people would answer the phone. They're home at dinner time. That's the idea. Uh, it turns out this device is still available on Amazon and it still works on landlines. And that's an important lesson. We'll talk about more about that in, in a bit, how we can use that lesson for smartphones. Now, the second thing that happened in the 90s was the creation of a website, a website uh, created by the US Federal Trade Commission called do not call.gov. And the idea was um, that anybody could list any, anybody who owned a landline and later a, uh, a, a cell phone line could go to this website and register their name and number 
And the Federal Trade Commission would publish that information and tell robocallers, do not call this. And they had an enforcement mechanism too. Um, any cold call, meaning from a business having no prior business relationship with you, subjects the cold caller to a fine of, get this, $11,000 per call. So if they placed 100 calls, it would be $110,000. And if they placed 1,000, it would be 1.1 million total fine. Sounds pretty steep. Sounds like it would be pretty effective, right? Well, there's only one catch, and that is the Federal Trade Commission relies on you as the registered owner of the phone number to obtain the caller's caller ID and provide it through that website to the Federal Trade Commission so they, they can enforce the fine. Now, it worked for a few years, but eventually robocallers found ways to work around it. And we're gonna look at those because it's important to understand the reality of this situation. Uh, the next thing that happened was that a number of organizations started keeping track of the numbers from which robocallers called. They used, they looked at caller IDs, just like anybody else. And they developed a list of called a blacklist of numbers from, uh, from which robocallers typically called. And this even worked for a while. A number of organizations developed websites or apps or combinations of websites and apps to enforce blacklists. And that includes Verizon Wireless, the company that is my carrier company, uh, we're going to talk, I have some statistics to show you later on about how well or how poorly, uh, which is the more accurate view, uh, their system worked. Um, there's other systems uh, that will work on any smartphone, including Umail and Nomo Robo. Uh, Umail is free. Nomo Robo charges uh, subscription fees. And their primary mechanism is blacklist. But as it happened, uh, robocaller systems worked out a way to evade the blacklist. And let's talk about, we'll talk about that too. Why these systems do not call.gov and blacklist don't work anymore. Um, Robocallers found a combination of techniques that allow them to evade US law enforcement. And the first one is that they originate from spots outside of US legal jurisdictions, such as uh, the islands uh, in the Caribbean or other locations. Sometimes they actually originate from the US, but they go through what's called a virtual private network so that they seem to originate from outside of the US. Uh, there's a second technique, something that was introduced for a very legitimate business purpose by the, uh, the telephone switching system in the early 1960s, back when it was all AT&T. And it allows them to send what's called an incorrect or spoofed caller ID which is now almost inevitably what is done by robocallers, except for the ones who are idiots. Um, now, the third thing they do, instead of calling from a normal landline or cell phone line, they originate uh, the calls entering into the phone network through what's called voice over IP, which essentially means they're using a computer hooked to the internet. And that allows them to place calls but it also means that there's no such thing as a true caller ID whatsoever. Uh, the best thing that can be said is that uh, using tech, fairly advanced techniques, you might be able to determine where uh, the, the, what's called the IP or internet protocol address is for the people who are calling. However, even that can be hidden again using what's called a virtual private network connection so that you'll never find out what the real 
IP address is. Now, spoofing is the most interesting part of this because this is what allows them to create a caller ID shown to you as the call recipient that might look like it's a neighbor. Um, it makes it, it is one of those things that makes the calls anonymous and untraceable. And that means you can't find them, the FTC can't find them, nobody can find them. Uh, the result, of course, is that the phone number displayed by caller ID is not the number from which the robocaller system is actually calling. Uh, why does this capability exist? Well, it turns out in the early 1960s, uh, the telephone company switching systems were enhanced by adding this system that allows people to use a uniform caller ID in companies. And the idea was the companies have many offices, the companies might have a variety of different people who have to call you for a legitimate business purpose. And what the companies wanted was a way to display their switchboard number, regardless of the number from which their employees called. And that way you'd always know who was calling you instead of seeing a dozen different numbers from which a dozen different employees called you. So that was a what we call a benign or, or reasonable business purpose when it was introduced in the 1960s. But it was the 1960s, and because of that, they didn't put any security on it. And what that means is, from that time forward, anybody with sufficient information, including you, can use that system server feature to place a spoofed call, meaning a call with a, a caller ID number other than your own. And in many cases, some of the spoof numbers are actual real phone numbers belonging to other people. And then they get a call back from somebody who sees, oh, I got a call from this number, I'll call it back. And they call, they call and find out they reached a real human being who has no idea what they're talking about. That's not only happened to one of my coworkers when I was working for a living, but it also happened to my daughter. Uh, she got a call from somebody she didn't know, and they said they were returning the call. And what it really meant was that my daughter's caller ID was displayed falsely through spoofing. And I'm even gonna show you how to do it yourself. And I'm, then I'm gonna tell you why you shouldn't. There are websites that will enable anyone to spoof their own caller ID. Here's a picture of one of them. And the key for all these websites is they're gonna ask you for your phone number and they're gonna ask you for the phone number they want to call, that you want to call. And the idea is that they will place the call for you and call you to connect you and call the person you, that you uh, identified as the recipient, but the recipient will not see your number. Now, remember this, you gave them two real phone numbers to make it work, yours and the call recipients. But there's a hidden consequence that you may not be aware of. The spoofing site requires you to provide the real number you call from and the number of the call recipient. Two real phone numbers. But since the spoofing sites are used many, many times a day, or at least they hope they are, they collect those real numbers and sell them to robocallers. Anytime you put up a real number or provide it to somebody on the web, then there's a chance that they can sell it. So uh, let's sort of summarize what we've learned. Robocall systems now change their spoofed ID, their caller ID constantly. Uh, blacklists simply can't keep up. And in many cases, what they're blacklisting turns out to be a number of a real human being. Uh, now, typically a robocall system is set up to call many, many different numbers at the same time. Suppose they call a thousand numbers. 
Well, these days, they literally use a thousand different spoofed caller IDs so that even a report to the FTC doesn't allow the FTC to establish, oh, they must have all originated from the same place because they see a thousand different spoofed caller IDs reported. But Telezapper still works. Although it cannot be attached to a smartphone, its technique of playing these special information tones works to convince robocall systems that the number they have called is no longer in service. So now we're going to get down to the two parts of the robocall defense that you can do personally. And the first one is setting up your phone so that the only people who can ring your phone are people you know, people in your contacts list. And that's called a whitelist approach. So here's a summary. After this summary, I'm going to show you in detail, including screen captures, how to do this on your smartphone. You set your phone to what's called do not disturb mode. This exists both on, both on Android and on iPhone. Your smartphone allows you to specify exceptions for do not disturb. The basic idea of do not disturb originally was you could set it at night when you don't want to be awakened. But you can now, uh, now you can set it for a 24 seven basis and then establish exceptions, meaning callers who will ring your phone when they call. And what you would do is set this exception is uh, called contacts. And when you set that, that means everybody in your smartphone contacts list will be allowed to ring your phone when they call. So we call that a whitelist. All other calls do not ring your phone. However, if this is all you do, setting up the whitelist approach through do not disturb, the phone will ring when a robocaller calls. It will light up your screen and allow the robocaller to leave voicemail. Now, if it's a caller you care about, and a legitimate voicemail, you can call them back. Um, as I mentioned, this is a whitelist. I call it a pure whitelist because your phone will ring only from uh, for calls from numbers in your contacts. So you can think of the entire range of possible callers as contacts, unwanted robocalls, and other calls. And some of those other calls may be important to you, maybe not. I get a call about once every two weeks from my congressman on Capitol Hill. Do I care? No. I voted for the man. I trust him to do the right stuff, but I don't necessarily want to hear about it. Um, pure blacklist strategy excludes robocalls, but it allows unknown robocalls, robocalls from numbers that haven't been identified as. A, rob uh, a robocall uh, originator. And because of the modern use of spoofing, no blacklist is ever complete. Uh, I actually used a blacklist app called Verizon Wireless Call Filter, and it blocked roughly 50% uh, compared to the time before I started using that app. Um, there are limitations. I mentioned this one previously. Sometimes a robocall will show your own number as the caller ID of the person calling you. That obviously can't happen, but it does because they use spoofing to make it happen. Now, it should be easily recognized when that happens because you know your own phone number, or at least most of us do these days. Uh, since I have my own number in contact, such a spoof would ring my phone. Now, having established the impact of a whitelist approach, we're going to go through how to set it up step by step. Uh, this is the Android technique, and that means for you all who are using iPhones, you can snooze for a minute or two. Um, in Android, open up the settings app. Uh, in 11, Android 11 and 12, 
it'll look something like this. And what you want to tap is the word notifications. I've circled it for you here in the illustration, the screen capture. And that opens a screen called the notification screen. We're going to see that now. Here it is. And just by the way, if you tap this by accident, you can always hit the left arrow in the upper left corner to go back to the main settings screen. But in notifications, to enable do not disturb, you need to find the do not the word do not disturb on the screen. And it's pretty near the top. I've circled it for you here. And then tap that item. And that opens another screen called, what a surprise, do not disturb. Here it is. Um, now, in 11 and 12, they allow you to establish multiple do not disturb schedules. And we're going to learn that technique, Android 11 and 12. In earlier versions of Android, there was just one schedule allowed, but you can still use it. So when you tap add, add schedule, a screen opens called new schedule. And here's that screen. Now, there's three important things in this screen. At the very top, a name for the schedule because Android and 11 and 12 allow you to create multiple schedules. So how do they distinguish one from another? Because you give each one a separate name. The second thing is what days of the week do you want it to apply to? And the default setting, by the way, is all seven days of the week. Yeah, and you can see them uh, here all appear in bold and the word every day shows up. That means it's a 24 seven schedule. Now, the default times are the third part. And they appear below the days. There's a start time and an end time. So in this case, the default in Android is basically what they think are the normal hours for people who want to take it easy overnight, maybe is the right way to put it. Um, start time at 10 p.m., end time at 7 p.m. the next morning. So we're going to change that because we want Do Not Disturb to be in effect all the time. and. What we'll do, I, what I've done is magnify here now in the lower right corner, the start time and the end time, just to make it crystal clear, the defaults. And what we're going to do is change the end time. So we're going to change it to 9.59 p.m. So that when it ends, it starts again one minute later. It's very easy to do. Uh, if you start by tapping the end time. And a set time pop-up appears at the bottom of the screen, just like I've depicted here. And it breaks the end time setting into three parts, hours, minutes, and AM, PM. And each of those is scrollable up and down to change the values. So in this case, we want to change 7 AM to 9.59 PM. It's actually very easy. So we change seven to nine by scrolling it. We change zero, zero to 59. And that's super easy because we can actually see 59 sort of ghosted there. You just uh, scroll to that and finally change AM to PM, which is also super easy because there's only two values possible. All right, now once you've done all that, then the end time should change to 9.59 PM in the display called end time. And you just, by the way, the last thing you have to do is tap the done button, which I've circled for you there. And then you should see the new end time in the screen. The pop-up closes and there it is. Now, if you didn't get it right, just tap end time again and repeat. You can edit it as much as you need to, to get it right. All right, now once you do that, you have to fill in a name, uh, at least for Android 11 and 12. Earlier versions, uh, they didn't allow you to change multiple schedules, so they didn't, uh, they didn't provide a schedule name because there's only one possible in earlier versions of Android. Uh, once you filled in the name, 
there's a button at the bottom right corner called save that will become active once you've filled in the name. It won't activate until you have finished filling in a name. And I suggest a simple name like 24 seven. Tap the save button when it's activated. And this is what you'll see in that do not disturb screen. You will see a schedule that exists with a name, uh, the list of days that it uh, is uh, used for, in this case, every day, and the uh, hours. Now, if you look carefully at what I've circled, you'll see that I made a mistake. I listed every day, 10 p.m. to 10.59 p.m., which is basically one hour out of the day. But it's very easy to tap the schedule again and then edit it to make it correct. The other thing you'll see just to the right of that circle is there, a there is a switch that allows you to turn that schedule on and off. And right now it's set to the on position, which means it's set to the right. Now, the next thing you have to do is establish the whitelist exception so that calls can get through. And to do that, we tap calls, messages, and conversations. And you see, I circled that here for you too, so you can see where it is on the screen. Okay, that opens another new screen. And there's two things we're gonna do in this screen. The first one is the word calls. And you can see that initially it's set to allow all calls to come through, and we don't want that. We don't want the spoof calls to come through. We just want calls from our contacts to come through. So we're gonna change that by tapping the word calls and it'll show you a pop-up in which contacts only appears. And you'll see that here in just a moment. There it is. I haven't quite circled it correctly, but tap the first, the choice that is appears in blue here is called all. And we want to tap contacts only instead, which is the next one down. When you do that, the pop-up will disappear. And you'll see that under calls, the word contacts only appears, confirming that we have arranged for our friends in contacts to be able to ring our phones. And at that point, you can tap the left arrow and go back to the do not disturb screen. Now, this is the way I initially tried to set this up. And I made a critical mistake, which I'm going to describe so you can recognize it if you happen to make the same mistake. You turn on the do not disturb switch at the top of the screen. And I did all of that. I thought it was enough. But while my son and I were shopping, uh, he had his own cart and I had mine. And we were, it was a very large grocery store, Wegmans. And uh, my son called me. I was actually sitting at the pharmacy office waiting to get uh, annual uh, uh, fall flu shot. And uh, when he called me, I had this very interesting experience. Um, the phone was in my pocket. I heard the phone ring. I pulled it out. And what did I see? The screen stayed dark. There was no buttons to tap or uh, to accept, or for that matter, to ignore the call. What do I do? Well, I figured it out. This is what needs to be done. There's an additional thing in the do not disturb screen that you have to take care of. And it's a heading called hide notifications. It's at the bottom of the screen. It's almost hidden here, but I circled it so that you know where to look to find it. And when you tap that, there's a separate screen that appears called hide notifications. And what you need to do in this is turn off everything, all the switches, and they'll look like what you see here when they're turned off. It turns out that the switches are not off by default, but turn them all off. And when I did that, I was able to call my son back and ask him to call me again. Once I turned them off, I, I hit the back arrow to get out, to return to the do not disturb screen. 
And when he called me again, my phone lit up because he was in my contacts list. So I was able to hit the button to accept the call. Very simple. Uh, comment here about uh, older versions of Android. Uh, it was in a different place. Instead of notifications in the settings app, it was under sound and vibration. So if you're using an older version of Android, that's how you get to the do not disturb screen. All right. And if you can't even remember that stuff, all you have to do at the top of the settings main screen is type in the search field, do not disturb. And it'll give you a link to that page so you can go there immediately. All right, it's time for all you iPhone users to wake up. Your nap is over. We're gonna discuss now how to configure iPhones for this behavior. And those of you who have Android, you can take a break for a moment. Uh, the iOS 15 technique looks like this. Uh, under settings, there is, you open the settings app and there is a link called focus. And that's what you need to tap in order to find the do not, dis the link for the do not disturb screen. So when you do that, the focus screen appears, it looks like this and the very first choice in it is do not disturb. Now I circled it for you. So when that screen appears, you tap do not disturb and here's the do not disturb screen in, and in uh, iOS. Um, you find this, uh, the heading turn on automatically and just below that, there is a default schedule. And it turns out the default the schedule is not turned off or turned on immediately, it's off. And it says so right there uh, to the right of the uh, number 12 a.m and uh, the words every day. So you're gonna tap that just to confirm that it's the schedule that you need. It turns out the way Apple set it up, it is. But you tap that, the schedule screen opens that allows you to edit the schedule if you need to. And this is what it looks like. From 12 a.m. to 12 a.m., seven days a week, but the schedule is turned off. So you need to turn it on. You tap that switch at the top, which I circled. If it's off, you will not see the color and it will be not be to the right. So you need to tap it and it'll move from the left to the right and reveal that green color. And it'll even show you this little heading up here that says do not disturb is turned on. Once you do that, then you can tap the arrow in the upper left corner to go back to the do not disturb screen. And now it says it's turned on. That's exactly what you need. All right, now we also need to establish an exception to do not disturb. And unlike Android in these Apple phones, the default exception is no exceptions. Nobody will be able to call you. So you definitely need to change that. So we tap people and the allowed notification screen appears. It looks like this. And what I want you to do is tap calls from. And the circle, I don't know why it appears where it did. I, I spent a day and a half editing this thing to make sure it all looked fine. Obviously it didn't quite work, did it? But uh, you're going to tap that phrase calls from that appears just below the red circle in this illustration. And that opens a separate screen called phone calls. And it's got four different headings. Everyone, no one, which is the default, favorites and contacts, all contacts. As it happens, what you want to tap, there we go, is not favorites. That's the default. You want to tap all contacts, which is immediately below favorites. And once you do that, there's one other thing that is worth changing. There's a switch that is actually slightly cut off in this illustration called allowed 
let's see here, allowed repeated calls. This allows people to get through to you if they call twice within about a minute. Now, the problem is robocallers know that. And so if they don't get through to you the first time, they may ring you a minute later and you don't want that one to call, uh, come through. So the default position of that switch is allow. You want to turn that switch off. Turn allow repeated calls off. Then hit the back button at the upper left corner of that screen. Uh, in the, you're back in the allowed notification screen. Tap the back button because you're done here. And then the do not disturb screen reappears. One other thing to make sure of is that the do not disturb switch is turned on. And that's the position I show you here uh, on this screen. It's the do not disturb switch is at the very top of the screen. Now you can turn that switch off anytime you expect an incoming call from somebody who's not in your contacts list. And this is the advantage of a schedule. After receiving that call, while the do not disturb screen, uh, do not disturb switch is turned off. If you forget to turn the do not disturb switch back on, then the schedule you have already established will do that for you automatically. You don't have to remember to turn it on because the schedule will do it for you. All right, so those of you who are Android users, wake up now and we'll talk about some other things that are important to know for all smartphones. Um, the first thing that's pretty obvious with this uh, whitelist technique is that you need to keep your contacts up to date. And I wanna suggest some important things to uh, categories that you may wish to keep up to date. First of all, your doctors. If your doctor ever mo uh, physically moves the uh, location and or otherwise finds a need to establish a new phone number, that's very important to keep in your contacts list. Secondly, your lawyers. Third, your veterinarian. And actually, that's one that I didn't have in my contacts list. I put my uh, uh, kid's cat over for a, uh, uh, some sort of checkup and uh, realized an hour later, I didn't have the number in their list and they had to call me so I could come pick up the cat. So I turned off Do Not Disturb to make that happen. Your stockbrokers, that's another good thing. If you, uh, I, I use the web to communicate with my stock brokerage, but not everybody does that. So if you use your phone, make sure the number is in your phone. Uh, your bankers. And the next one is probably the most important. Publishers Clearinghouse. You sure want them to be able to get through. Okay, now. Just for a moment, I'm gonna discuss the two most widely popular robocall blocking apps. The first one is a subscription-based service called Nomo Robo, and it claims to update its blacklist of Nomo known robocallers every 15 minutes. Um, there's not much information on its website to describe its service other than that. Um, now, Umail, they provide a lot more information about how they do what they do. It is free. You don't have to pay for it, which means it's probably supported by ads. I've not tried it. I don't know that for sure. But it, uh, the first thing it does, whenever, uh, if you have the app installed, um, it redirects your incoming calls to their servers. And the first thing the servers do is enforce the Umail blacklist. And if a call comes in from a number that's known to, uh, to be within the blacklist, then they play the special information tones. And that tells the blacklisted caller that your number isn't in service. It's not true, but hey, it's an effective way to deter them from calling you again. Uh, now, the second thing is you have to give your contacts list to Umail. Uh, that allows them to redirect calls from your contacts back to your phone, so your phone rings. 
And all voicemails that come in when your phone is unavailable are saved on email servers, not phone company servers, and are transcribed and sent to you as text messages. Also, you can listen to those voicemails on their servers, just like you would listen to normal voicemails on your carrier company's uh, inbox. Okay, now, now that we know all of that, let's talk about how we can prevent even voicemails from robocallers. And basically, to give you a little hint of what we're going to talk about, uh, we use the telezapper technique. Can't connect one to your to your uh, smartphone, but you can nonetheless make the same thing happen. And we're going to see how to do that step by step. Okay. Robocaller systems like any high volume system, uh, they're, they're designed for time efficiency. And what does that mean? Basically, they want to call numbers known to be in service. And as we all know, they call ad nauseum. But how do they recognize that a number is in service? Well, there's two things. One is if it's answered, and two is if it's answered by a voicemail greeting. Either way, they consider that number to be in service and they're going to leave a message, at least most of them. I've gotten some interesting ones. I, I mentioned one from somebody claiming to be the power company. Uh, I've gotten three or four that are in some Asian language, I assume to be Mandarin Chinese. I don't really know. I don't speak that. Um, now, the next significant point is that uh, calling numbers known to be not in service is definitely a waste of robocaller system time, and they want to avoid that waste because these high-volume robocaller systems, they're not cheap. They cost a lot of money. Um, now, the systems recognize that any number that answers with special information tones is not in service. That's important. That's what Telezapper relies on to keep robocalls off your voice line. Um, and when they hear those special information tones, robocaller systems do not leave voicemail. And they also don't call again. They put your, they delete your number from their list of active numbers. So, that's the way to prevent them from continuing to clog your inbox. This is why Telezapper works. And we can take advantage of that behavior. You may not yet understand why, but I'm going to explain it. Basically, we're going to create a voicemail greeting that starts with sit tones. And I even have an example coming up that you can listen to. Okay, so in most carrier company voicemail systems, there are three options. The first option is totally automated and it, it basically it tells the company servers to use a message that includes your phone number and not your name. And it'll look something like this. You have reached 703-555-1111. Please leave a message after the beep. That simple. Now, the second option looks like this. You, what they ask you to do is record your pronunciation of your name so that people can hear it and recognize your voice. And it'll look it'll, it's something like what I've quoted here. You have reached the phone of John Kraut. Please leave a message after the beep. All of that's automated except for the name. You record your name and they insert it in the middle of that greeting. But there's a third option, and this is the one we're going to take advantage of. Play a recording of ever, whatever you want to say as a greeting. That's what we're going to use. Now, this is a transcript of the greeting that I use. And you're going to hear this in just a moment, but I just I, I provide this simply so that 
if you need a some sort of uh, voicemail greeting script, you can use this if you want, although you have to change the name uh, to yours. Now, um, that brings up another point. I didn't mention this initially, I should mention it. Uh, after our presentation today, all of these slides will be converted to a PDF and I will send that PDF to your club so they can post it on your club's website or send it to you individually in an email. And all of this information, all of the websites, all of the apps I mentioned, all of this information will be available to you in that PDF. And just by the way, where I mentioned a URL, you can click on the URL on the PDF and your web browser will open to that web page. So uh, I do that in case maybe I've gone a little too fast for you to take notes. Uh, on the next slide, you're going to actually hear the voicemail greeting, including the sit tones at the beginning of it. But I do have to do one thing. I have to click on that little box. Hi, this is John. No, my number is not disconnected. Those tones were just meant to convince robocallers not to call me again. You can leave a message after the beep. Thanks. Okay, so as I said, it's a combination of the sit tones and whatever I wanted to say. And I actually combined those using Audacity, which is a free sound editor that you can download onto your personal computer. Uh, I happen to produce this using Audacity on a Windows 10 computer. I downloaded the sit tones from a public source. And actually, I've cleaned it up a bit, and I'm going to give you the URL that I established so that you can download the sit tones. Secondly, you can record your voice either using Audacity and a, a microphone such as your webcam microphone or whatever you use as a uh, microphone on your computer, or you can record it on your smartphone. I'm going to show you apps for that. And then you can transfer that to your computer and then combine the two using Audacity, or if you have an uh, Apple computer, you can combine it using GarageBand for that matter. Oops, I didn't mean Hi, that. Hi, this is John. No, my number is not disconnected. Those tones were just meant to convince robocallers not to call me again. <laughs> you can leave a message after the beep. I guess, I guess I tapped the wrong thing. I didn't mean to play that for you twice. I meant to go to the next slide. Here we go. So. When you do this kind of custom greeting, what are the impacts? Well, first of all, robocallers that do call you hang up without leading, leaving any voicemail because they figure, okay, this line's disconnected. Um, they also remove your number from their active numbers list, which means they won't call again. Now, there are hundreds or maybe thousands of robocaller systems around the US. So you won't see an instant massive decrease in the number of robocalls reaching your phone. It, it'll take a few months for all of them to call you. Um, but you will see a decrease. Now, how about your friends when your friends call or your doctors? Um, most of my friends listen to the entire voicemail and leave a message. But, of course, some of them hear the sit tones and hang up. They wonder what's going on. Now, this is why it's important to look in the list of recent calls on your smartphone. If there's somebody who didn't leave a message whose name you recognize, call them back. It's that simple. Okay, now, here are the statistics. Folks, this is literally what I saw as an ex as a statistical experience in the decrease in robocalls as a result of using the do not disturb technique and with the whitelist and the uh, voicemail greeting you just heard. Uh, before I did any of that, I was receiving roughly 25 robocall voicemails per week. And they were filling, I, I literally had to clean out the, the inbox twice per week. I got really tired of that. So in mid-2018, I decided 
I already had the Verizon Wireless Call Filter Blacklist app. I decided to turn it on. And it excluded about half of them. So I was still getting roughly 12 robocall voicemails per week. So I had to clean it out. I had to clean out the voicemail inbox once a week instead of twice. It was still irritating. So um, I did some research at the beginning of 2019 and one of the things that was mentioned was this idea of using the sit tones in a voicemail greeting. Uh, so I tried it and I uh, figured out how to install it uh, through my uh, smartphone uh, and created the greeting using Audacity. I'm going to show you how to do that step by step. And after eight months, I found that my rate of incoming robocalls fell to two per week. How did I know that? Because I looked in recent calls. And after that same eight months of experience, my rate of incoming voicemails from robocallers fell to zero per week, none. And I thought that was a dramatic improvement. All right, so we've already taught you how to do the whitelist approach. Now we're going to look at how to make and install a custom greeting. And folks, I'll admit, this takes a bit of learning and a bit of work. Not a lot. It takes more time to explain it than it does to actually do the work. All right, so we're going to look at how to make a custom greeting like I use. The first thing you have to do is obtain the sit tones recording, and I'm going to give you a place to download it for free. Record your own voice greeting that will ultimately follow the sit tones. And when we create that combined greeting, we'll store it on the computer. And I'm going to show you three different ways to transfer it from your computer into your smartphone just as if you were speaking the whole thing yourself. Okay, now, for starters, where can you get the sit tones? This is an audio file that I created by taking a, uh, sit tones from uh, a website where uh, literally hundreds of uh, phone company uh, special information messages were curated, meaning they were posted just for historical purposes. So I downloaded one of those. I ended up clipping out the, the words that were spoken by the, uh, the voice of the phone company. And so I only had the sit tones at that point. And I cleaned up the sit tones by removing the audio noise that was included in the original recording. Here's the URL. and if you happen to be able to scan a QR code using your phone or your computer, then you can scan this QR code to download that audio file. Uh, when you use this URL, uh, you'll find that it will uh, offer to download it immediately. It won't even show you a picture in your, in your browser. It'll just ask you if you want to download it and you click yes. Um, Okay, once you've done require once you've obtained that, you need to record your voice greeting. I recommend using a script. And you can either write one yourself or you can use mine. Uh, you can either in if you have an Android phone, you can download a voice recording app for your phone. I'm going to recommend one for you. Uh, if you have an iPhone, it's already installed. It has been for many, uh, I, at least back to version 10 of iOS. We're at version 15 now. Version 16 is going to come out in the next week or so. Uh, and once you have that app, then you set the app to record in mono, not stereo, because mono is what's used on the, uh, the uh, voicemail greeting storage uh, on your uh, carrier company servers. And you also want it to record in the highest quality. Um, 
so you record your voice using the app then that recording file is on your smartphone we want to copy the recording file from your phone to your computer um if you download the sit tones wave file to your phone then you need to copy that to your computer as well okay now here's the android app that i use and it's called voice recorder it's a very generic name the one i use the publisher's name is ray technoto labs so that's how you can tell it from the other ones that are also called voice recorder. Here is the nature. Here is the main screen of this voice recorder app while it's recording a voice. You have a, a, a moving graph that looks something like an oscilloscope graph. And down at the bottom, you have three buttons. The one you need to know about is the one in the middle. It's a square button while you're recording. You tap that to end the recording. When you're not recording and you want to start, it's a round button. It changes to square once you tap it. So that's how you start recording. You tap the round button. And how you stop recording, you tap the square button. They're both in the same place. Uh, when you make a recording, it's, in, it's stored in this storage folder on your Android phone. It's called internal storage. And under that, there is a folder called quick voice recorder and that's where you'll find every one of the recording files uh, the default naming for each recording file is uh it involves a serial number so the first one you create is number one then number two then number three and so forth and in order to adjust the quality to make sure it's mono and make sure it's in high, highest quality, you tap the gear button. I've circled it here, almost circled it here. Um, and that brings up a screen that lets you to select the recording features that you want to use. Now, in iOS, as I said, the voice recording app is already on your phone. It's found in this folder. Uh, called Utilities, and I've circled the app within the folder. The name of the app is Voice Memos. And this is what its screen looks like. It's very similar to the other one, the Android app. Uh, the graph appears at the bottom while you're recording, and it has a round button when you're not recording. You tap that, it changes to the square button that's depicted here at the bottom of the screen. You tap that to end the recording and store it on your phone. Um, once you've created a recording file, you can save it to the iCloud drive and then access it there from your uh, personal computer uh, using iCloud.com. Uh, now, unlike Android, the settings for each app in Apple phones is in the settings itself on your iPhone. So you tap that and you're gonna to have to search for the heading voice memos because it lists every app on your phone. And uh, you choose voice memos and then you can, uh, in that you can alter the voice quality to lossless for the uh, best quality. Now, once you have recorded your voice and transferred it to your computer, you need a way to edit, to combine those two recordings, the sit tones and your voice greeting. I'm gonna show you how to do that using the Audacity app, which is a free audio editor. And I might add a really great product. Um, it is available for Windows and Mac and Linux, here is the URL that'll get you to the place where you can download that free app onto your computer. www.audacityteam.org. Um, now, what I'm going to show you was created with the latest version of Audacity, which is 3.1.3. .3. Uh, I recorded these screens on Windows 11 Home uh computer uh 64 bits 
it shouldn't look any different if you're using an older computer uh, or a different uh, operating system such as uh, uh, Mac OS. Um, and therefore, the depicted steps that I show you to combine two WAV files uh, should be identical on Apple or Linux, with one exception, and that is the standard dialog box to open a file. Those differ from, uh, they're very different on uh, Apple computers, and very different on Linux computers compared to Windows computers. Okay, so. For starters, we have to be able to open a file. You have to know the folder in which you have stored your sit tone recording and your voice recording. So the first thing we're going to do is load sit tones, and this is how you do it. You pull down the Audacity file menu, select import in that menu. That'll pop up a submenu, and in that submenu, you want to select audio. Use your standard dialog box for open file to move to the folder that contains your WAV file for the sit tones. And then select the sit tones WAV file, which I've depicted here, not very large, but the point is you select that file and then at the bottom right corner in Windows, you tap the open button in order to open that file in Audacity. And this is what it'll look like. It's not a very long file. There's actually a, a, a time scale just above the file. And you can see this thing is basically just a hair under two seconds long, not very long at all. Uh, in the track, the audio is displayed as sort of like an oscilloscope graph with time moving from left to right. There, I've circled the time scale for you, uh, just so you're aware of it. It's gonna change because our, our typical voice recording file is a lot longer. And we'll see that when we load that second file into Audacity. There's also something new until uh, Audacity, I think 3.1. Um, this didn't exist, but uh, uh, immediately above that oscilloscope-like graph, is the name of the file that you loaded. And in this case, it's called sit tones. And I've pointed to it, I call that the name bar. Um, that's gonna be important later on because it makes actually compared to prior versions of Audacity, it makes our editing work a whole lot easier. So the second thing you have to do is import your voicemail greeting recording, the uh, recording of your voice, Use exactly the same techniques, file, import, audio. Uh, then you use the open file dialog box to move to the folder where you stored that greeting and select it and tap the open button, just like we saw earlier. And this is what happens in Audacity. It changes the time scale so that the voice track is depicted in its entirety, in my case, it's about 12 seconds long. And you'll notice that it starts at the same point in time as the sit tones. We need to change that. All right, so now we've got two tracks, sit tones first because we opened it first, and then the greeting in a second track below the first. Now, the next thing we need to do is move the greeting track so that it starts after the sit tones end. How do we do that? Well, that's where the name bar becomes so useful. You move your mouse to the name bar of the second track. And here, as it happens, I've circled where my mouse was at the beginning of this movement effort. Uh, when you move it to the, na uh, the name bar, it becomes a hand, just like I circled here. To move the track to the right to a later point in time, you simply click and drag that name bar, drag it to the right, 
And this is what it should look like when you're done with the click and drag. The beginning of your voice track should be end af just after it should begin just after the end of the sit tones. Roughly half a second is plenty. Okay, now once you've done that, you need to save that audio as an audio file. Here's how we do it. Pull down the Audacity file menu, you select export. And in the sub menu, you select export as wave. And then the standard dialog box pops up to allow you to save a file in a known folder because you have to remember where it is so you can use it. You export the combined audio file to that folder. You don't have to do anything special. It'll export both tracks autom automatically. But there is one thing you have to know about the file menu. There is a choice in the file menu called save. It does not, let me emphasize that, it does not save an audio file. It is used to save what's called a project file. That's in case you don't get all the work done, you can save the project file and then reopen it later so that you are working with the same two tracks immediately or the same 15 tracks if you have 15. But the point is it doesn't save an audio file. Okay, now that's all you need to do in Audacity. Now you have a combined greeting. You can play it to your heart's content. You can use an app on Windows. Uh, Windows Media Player will play it. Uh, I use often uh, uh, VLC, another free app that you can download uh, uh, to play audio files. Uh, but now we have to install it. And I mentioned it earlier that each voicemail greeting uh, is stored not on your phone, because sometimes your phone isn't even in touch with the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, phone network, but rather in servers owned by the carrier companies, such as AT&T or T-Mobile or Verizon Wireless. Whoever your carrier company is, they save your voicemail greeting in their servers. And that's so they can play it even if your phone is literally out of touch with any cell phone tower in the world. Because sometimes people call when your phone isn't in touch. Okay, now, having said that, how do we get it onto the servers? Well, as I said, they play it even when your phone is turned off or away from a cell tower. Um, the carrier, uh, unfortunately, although at least one company did this in the past, now the carrier companies do not permit uploading of an audio file to use as a voicemail greeting. And the reason is they got embarrassed several times because people hacked and installed a rather uh, embarrassing voicemail greeting in somebody else's phone number. So they eliminated that upload feature. Uh, instead, we must find a way to speak our combined greeting. I put that in quotes. While the phone is set to record whatever it hears. And that recording is placed on the carrier company servers as your voicemail greeting. All right. Now, I can't really teach you because I don't know your carrier company. I can't really teach you how to record a custom greeting. That varies from one company to another. Each carrier company has its own method and sometimes they even change that method. So you need to learn that on your own. And the best thing you can do is practice it a few times. So you're familiar with it before you attempt to record the combined greeting that you've created as a greeting on your smartphone. Um, I'm going to show you three different ways to record your combined greeting on your smartphone while the phone, what this amounts to is the work you do involves first telling your phone to start recording and second, and very quickly after the first part, start playing that audio so that the phone can hear it. And there's basically three different ways to do it. The lo-fi method, which I learned in high school, although it didn't involve a phone, 
hold the phone up to a computer speaker and play the combined greeting recording so that the audio moves through the air from the speaker to the phone's microphone. I call it lo-fi because it's definitely low fidelity. Uh, there is a cash out of pocket method. I say that because you have to spend some money to buy some cables. And that's what I actually used when I set up my voicemail greeting. I already own the cables. I own those long before I developed this method. And I'll show you, uh, particularly for iPhone, a fairly inexpensive set of cables to use. But there is a third method. And so far, I've only been able to uh, confirm that this works for Android. And that is use a combination of an app on Android and an application on the computer to transfer the audio over your home network, your LAN Wi-Fi, from the computer to the microphone of your smartphone. And it works. And it's pretty good fidelity. OK. We're going to talk about that first. So uh, Apple users sit back for a moment, and I'm going to talk about the Android Wi-Fi method. Um, this involves two things to download. One is an application called SoundWire Server. And the second one is a corresponding phone app that works together with SoundWire Server, and it's known as SoundWire Free. So the, the, the two icons here depict first uh, the uh, icon for SoundWire server on the computer, and the second one down below depicts the icon for SoundWire free on an Android phone. Both of them are free. Um, there is one requirement. Both your computer and your phone must be on the same local area network. And in particular, if you are a user of a virtual private network, a VPN, you need to shut down the VPN clients on your Android phone and your computer, because otherwise they won't be able to talk to each other. Um, the basic point of this method is that SoundWire server application on the computer captures computer audio originating from any application. It can be Windows Media Player, it can be VLC, it can be anything else. And sends that audio to the phone app. The phone app injects that audio into what's called the microphone device on your Apple computer. Uh, here's where you can get the SoundWire server computer application. It's a website called georgielabs.net. It looks like this. This is the home page for georgielabs.net. And it supports several different versions of Windows and uh, also supports a couple of different versions of Linux and uh, actually three if you count Raspberry Pi because it's also Linux. Doesn't support Macintosh. I'm sorry about that, but that was their choice. You need to click on the version that corresponds to your personal computer operating system and download and install the application. Um, now, when you run that application on a Windows computer, it looks like this. And there's one thing I want to point out. It will supply what's called a server IP address. I've circled it here on the screen. Um, it's very important info. You may need it, you may not. And I'll explain the condition under which you may need it here in just a moment. There's one other thing you might notice just below the server address, big, a big red word that says disconnected. This is normal. Do not worry that it says disconnected. It'll change once you get the app running on your Android phone. So here's the depiction of the app, and it's just ridiculously simple to use. It has a big button in the middle of the screen. You tap and hold that big button for about a third of a second. And that forces the app to attempt to contact the SoundWire server application on your computer. 
And most of the time it'll work. Um, but there are certain situations where it might not work automatically. There's another feature, unfortunately, it's off the bottom of the screen here, but there's a field in which you can tap the server IP address. And then once you do that, if it didn't connect initially, then you can tap and hold that big button again after you type in the, uh, the server address that you captured from the computer application. And when that connection is established, the status, uh, the status field in the SoundWire server application looks like this. It turns to green and it says connected. Um, Admittedly, if you're red, green, colorblind, you can't tell the difference in the color, but at least you could tell the difference between connected and disconnected. Um, now, once I initially made that connection, I did some tests and it turns out um, I, I played the uh, audio on the computer so that SoundWire server picked it up and sent it to my phone. And yes, I could hear it on my phone. Um, so it turns out I could hear also that it was delayed a little bit going through my home network, maybe a quarter of a second. Uh, not very long, but it was noticeable. Um, what I suggest you do if you use this technique is instead of attempting to record it immediately onto the servers of the carrier company as a voicemail greeting. First record it in voice recorder on your Android phone. So you can play it back and listen to it. And this is what I found out. Um, first of all, the graph in the voice recorder provides a very useful indicator of audio volume. And low audio volume produces a very tiny graph uh, you can increase the volume level on the computer, on the phone, uh, and in the application on the computer that's playing the audio in order to produce a tall graph in your recording. You may have to record it a couple of times as a test. I also noticed something else. I could hear other audio. Um, it was picking up the audio from the computer speakers which came in before the audio that was delivered by the, the, the sound wire technique. It's lower volume, but it was still audible. I also could hear things like the air conditioning in my home. And what this meant was, first, I could disconnect or mute the speakers on my computer or even plug them into headphones so I could still hear them. And block the microphones on the phone so they don't pick up all of that ambient noise in your uh, immediate area. Uh, it's very simple to do that. You can use bandage tape, you can use masking tape, you can use electrical tape uh, to block the microphones on your phone. And be aware, you may have more than one. Uh, there's two on my phone. There's one on the bottom, there's one on top. And this is a Android, uh, Samsung Galaxy S10. So it's actually designed about six years ago. And I bought it uh, three years ago. Um, it's very common for phones to have multiple microphones now. So you need to block every one of them. Retry a test recording, confirm that it sounds pristine without any of that other ambient noise. Now, there's another technique that eliminates the ambient noise automatically, and that is to connect your phone and your computer audio using a cable. And I found a very inexpensive cable that can accomplish that. Um, this cable in particular has two plugs on it, and one of those has a connector with two black rings. I've circled that connector here so you can count the number of black rings. There's two of them. And that end is what you connect to your computer's audio output socket. The other end of the cable has three black rings. I've circled that here so you can count them. And you attach that end to the, um, what used to be called the headset input socket on your phone. 
Now, I can hear it already. I know that some of you do not have a headphone input socket anymore. The recent Android phones and the recent iPhones have eliminated that socket, which I think is a big mistake. Nonetheless, I'm going to show you how to hook it up even if you don't have a headset socket. But first, the details on the cable. This cable I bought back in 2019. Um, actually, I think that date is wrong in the slide. I think it was 2019. But I will tell you, it's described on the page for the product as an adapter, but it does attenuate. I found that out by reading other web pages about the product. Uh, when I bought it, I confirmed that it does attenuate. What attenuate means is that it reduces the audio from the headphone level that comes out of your computer, or it's actually technically known as line level, to the microphone level that is required to go into your phone. That's what an attenuator does. It reduces the volume level by about a factor of 500 to, uh, in order to do that. Now, this particular cable, the least expensive I have ever found since Radio Shack closed, is part number FE-ADT-385. And when you pay for shipping, the total cost is about $15. It turns out that for most of the pandemic, it was out of stock. But earlier this year, it came back into stock. And as of a few days ago, uh, their website said it was still in stock. So I think it's probably made somewhere in Asia. and. Uh, the uh, the supply lines have uh, cleared back up, so to speak. Um, it was out of stock for roughly two years, but here is the uh, QR code that will uh, let you go directly to the product page. Otherwise, if you don't scan the QR code, you can go to mycablemart.com. It has a search bar at the top. And you click in that and put in the part number, it'll take you straight to that page. Okay, now Amazon also has an attenuator cable. It is a lot more expensive. $21.95, here it is. And it doesn't have the two connectors. It has a plug for the phone side and a socket for the computer side, which means we need another cable to connect that to the headphone output of your computer. And here's an example of such a cable. Uh, one plug plugs into that uh, socket on the attenuator cable and the other plug plugs into the computer. Uh, so you can see this is a lot more expensive. Uh, here's the patch cable page on Amazon and here's the attenuator cable page on Amazon. Okay, now we're getting close to the end, folks. Um, some comments about this, as I mentioned previously, recent models of iPhone and even Android phones now lack a headset socket. And I'm gonna show you another couple of cables that yes, it increases your price, but this is how you can get it done. Uh, first of all, there's a, a type of cable called on-the-go, and I've depicted an iPhone on-the-go cable right here. It's $12 on Amazon. On-the-go turns your phone into a USB host so that you can connect USB peripherals to your phone. And I want to tell you, it's a blast to play with these things. You can connect a keyboard. You can connect a mouse. You can connect Ethernet if you want. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can accomplish with an on-the-go cable. Uh, the second thing you need is this cable, also on Amazon, uh, made by Sabrent. It is a USB sound adapter cable. It plugs, you can see it has a USB plug on it that plugs into that USB socket on the on-the-go to cable. And it provides a fully featured headphone socket on the other end. Uh, you'll also need the attenuator cable that I showed you on the previous slides. Um, now, the connections. 
Uh, first of all, with the attenuator cable, you connect that to the computer and to the socket on the Sabrent audio adapter cable. The other end of the Sabrent audio adapter cable is a USB plug. You plug that into the OTG adapter USB socket. And finally, you connect the, OS, the OTG adapter lightning uh, plug into the iPhone lightning socket. That gives you a complete headset socket and the means to convey the audio from the computer into that headphone socket. And your iPhone will be perfectly happy to record it using voice memos and also perfectly happy to play that audio directly into the server computers when you're ready to transfer the audio into your voicemail greeting. Uh, as I mentioned on iPhones, you can test that with the Voice Memos app. There are also similar OTG cables for Android. Of course, they have typically a USB-C or a micro USB uh, socket for connection to your Android phone. Uh, I suspect most Android phones that don't have a headset socket anymore all have a USB-C socket, but uh, OTG cables for USB-C sockets are also very inexpensive, actually less expensive than the iPhone OTG cables. Uh, otherwise, you use the same combination of cables and you can test with uh, the Voice Memos app that I recommended earlier. I actually used this cable method with my Android phone before I found and tested the SoundWire app. My Android phone, the Galaxy S10, does have a headset socket, so I didn't need to use an OTG cable. But it, uh, the main thing I ran into was that I recorded at too low a volume. And as a result, Verizon Wireless server system decided that I hadn't given them anything they could use. And so they defaulted to the default greeting number one, where they announced only the phone number for my phone. So what did I do? Well, I had to increase the volume. And as I mentioned earlier, you can use the computer's volume control, the sound player application's volume control, and finally the phone's volume control to increase the audio volume. The third time I tried the transfer, it worked because I increased the audio volume. Um, all right, we're done. I'm going to give you a, a brief recap of apps and hardware mentioned in this presentation. The voice recorder app for Android. Uh, here's the icon and here's the QR code so you can scan and uh, get to the, what, what this, uh, this particular um, QR code does is open the uh, Play Store to the page for voice recorder. It makes it very convenient for you to download and install that uh, app. Uh, for SoundWire Free, here is uh, the SoundWire Free icon and the QR code. Again, if you scan this, it'll open the Play Store to the page for SoundWire Free. And as a reminder, SoundWire comes in two parts. You also have to uh, download the SoundWire server app from georgielabs.net. Uh, here's that cable I mentioned a few minutes ago, the inexpensive cable from mycablemart.com. The uh, QR code I displayed here will open your web browser directly to the page for this cable. Uh, here's the iPhone OTG adapter. Uh, $12 product on Amazon, and again, the QR code that'll open that page on Amazon directly to that product. Makes it very easy to, very easy to find it. Um, here's the Sabrent USB audio adapter cable. Um, I only found this a few days ago and I ordered one immediately. I have not tested it yet, but I think it is the perfect product for this purpose uh, if you no longer have a headset socket on your phone. You combine this with an OTG cable, either for Apple or for Android, and uh, you have a, a, a headphone socket once again. So here's the QR code for uh, getting directly to this product page on Amazon. I want to mention a meeting that's coming up in about five weeks. Uh, uh, the, my home club, the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society, uh, 
On that day, I will be delivering a new presentation entitled Use a Windows App to Scan QR Codes. Uh, I only discovered this in the last few months and it is very convenient. Uh, for instance, I could give you the QR code for georgielabs.net um, and for uh, all those Android products and, and Apple products that are on Amazon. And you can scan those with your com uh, Windows computer and then go directly to those product pages on your Windows computer. Um, also on that same day, there will be a presentation following mine on favorite iOS apps and cross-platform synergies. Now what that, that particular speaker, um, I'm sorry, I, I went backwards. I don't know why that happened. Um, the, that particular speaker uses an iPhone and a Windows computer and by cross-platforms, he's talking about things that you can do using that combination to make your life easier. That's what synergies means anyway. Um, now, if you would like to attend, since you are an APCUG club, we offer what's called APCUG reciprocity. You can use Zoom to attend our meeting for free. And uh, all you have to do is request uh, a guest pass for October 15th. Uh, by writing to this email address. Now, here's an interesting QR code. If you scan this QR code with your phone, it will open your phone's email app with the email already written for you, although there are a couple of things you have to fill in, your name and the city and state where you live. Uh, because I, I created this QR code specifically for your group and that means that I filled in the user group name already in the QR in, in the email. So when you scan this, it'll fill in who it's going to, Fairfax meeting at padaces.org. It, it, it already has the subject line filled in. And you have to fill in a couple of things in the message area, and then you can hit send. It's very simple. And that's an example of the value of QR codes. And that's it. Now, what I'm gonna do is halt the uh, screen share and I'm sure you have questions. I will admit this is a lot to learn in a short time, which is why I'm going to send the PDF so that, so that you can review the slides at your own pace. So let me hit stop share. There we go. All right. So those of you who are not uh, overloaded, uh, I hope you'll have a few questions. Thank you. Wow, that was great. I've already converted my Android phone to stop those robo calls and it worked. I had my wife call me. She came, you know, the call came through and I've not had any robo calls since. So that was just fantastic. And I see Mike Sorn has raised his hand. So uh, let me see. I've got to make you uh, able to speak on that. And I'll have to it it, it looks like he's already unmuted. Unmuted. Oh, okay. Um, if I just create the tape and hold my uh, telephone near the uh, near the uh, computer, will that uh, be loud enough to get the tones through? Well. It's hard to say whether it'll be loud enough. The main issue is that you don't have the same uh, high frequency response. That is, uh, there may be some distortion that makes the sit tones harder to recognize when you do that method. Uh, speakers are not perfect uh, audio transfer uh, systems. So I provided that as uh, one method. And remember, I called it lo-fi for that very reason. But it is possible to do that. And so uh, if you feel like the money is too much of a challenge for cables, and if you're not using a Windows computer, uh, or rather an Android phone, so you can't use SoundWire, um, you're kind of, uh, lo-fi is, is the only other alternative. I will say, for those of you who have Apple phones, there is a system um 
and now I can't remember the name of it, but I tested it extensively for iPhone because I also have an iPhone. And the one difference was that system that behaves just like Soundwire was unable to communicate the audio to the microphone device on the Apple phone. And I wrote to those guys and I was explaining, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's why I'm trying to do it. Can you make a change so that it will inject the audio into the microphone device? And they wrote back and said, Apple has really locked down that device, so we can't do it. Now, I got to tell you, I know that's not true. Why do I know that's not true? Because Bluetooth can inject audio from an external microphone into the microphone device on Apple phones. And people have known that for ages. So I think these guys weren't actually being entirely honest with me, although they would have to switch from using uh, the LAN to communicate the audio from the computer to the iPhone to using Bluetooth. But most computers have Bluetooth built in now. So I don't know why they said that. Maybe they're just being lazy. But in any event, so far, there is no similar way to communicate audio from a computer to an iPhone. And I don't say that because I'm lazy. I say that because I've tried and tried and tried. And, I, uh, and, and even talked to the publisher of, of that audio uh, system for iPhones. and. Uh, so far, no solution is available. So Mike, I, I hope that keeps you informed. All right, who else? Mr. Vogel has his hand up and he's also unmuted. Yes, uh, the PDF files that you'll be uh, sending us, will the QR codes appear on those as it, they do on the screen? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm going to try to I'm going to try to fix those uh, illustrations where the circles weren't in exactly the right place also. But uh, definitely the QR codes and the URLs will be active. So you can click on a URL and go directly to the Georgie Labs page, directly to the uh, Audacity team page, for instance. Thank you. Sure. OK. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, you have to unmute. There you go. Hi, uh, thank you for that great presentation. And uh, thank you, Stan and Huey, for uh, arranging this great meeting today. Um, I have a strange issue with my cell phone that I think is the result of political campaigns. Every political <laughs> campaign, I get a bunch of text messages, stuff that I did not request. And these text messages are, are uh, name someone like, like Shan or Carmen or this or okay. other, and other names. Yep. The down and but but the bigger problem is that a few months ago when um, somehow or other someone's got the name of someone else in a database. So whenever I call any uh, landline phone, business phone or other cell phone that's not that, that I'm not programmed in as a contact, the name of someone else shows up. I have contacted, I, I called the customer no service for my phone company, it's with, with, interacted with three different agents to try to fix that, spent hours, and I even sent a letter to the phone company. And so far, I have no resolution of that. Okay. I, I have a suggestion for you that I have learned. First of all, I have to ask, do you have an iPhone or do you have an Android? It's an Android. Okay. So, in the text messaging application itself, when you view those messages, the name or in some cases the phone number or in some cases it'll look like an email address appears at the top of the screen. At the top of the screen, there is also directly to the right of that identification, there's a down arrow. Tap that down arrow. One of the choices, a pop-up menu will show up. One of the choices is block this. If it's an email address and you choose block, that email address will never be able to reach you again. 
if it is a phone number or a name representing a phone number, if you choose block this, that person will never be able to contact you again. Now, here's the real issue because it's political. What happens is there's some, and honestly, I don't know who. It's probably a commercial contractor that is hired by the political party. What happens is if it's a statewide race, then the statewide candidates campaign buys a copy of that phone number list from the contractor. And for a while, when I was getting those messages, I wrote back to the people and I said, look, I don't want to hear this stuff. Take me off your list and tell the contractor to take me off their list. Did it happen? No. They're too busy to respond to stuff like that because they're understaffed. So the thing to do is to use the block feature on your phone. Now, the problem, as I mentioned, is that they will not delete your number from their list. So the contractor will sell that list to the, you know, the next time somebody runs in, in your political district or your state, uh, they'll sell that list again to the candidate and the candidate will use it and then you'll have to block it again. Um, so it's not a perfect solution. It's not like, you know, the uh, using the sit tones in your voicemail greeting. That is a much more effective solution, but it does work. Um, and it took me a while to learn that myself. But uh, as I say, the alternative, trying to ask them to be honorable and uh, delete me from their database has never worked. Um, and the worst part about it is that sometimes they're addressed to my kids. I don't know why my kids gave out my phone number when they registered interest or donated money to a political party, but they did. And so I get uh, text messages addressed to my kids. Yeah, I, uh, I have blocked these numbers of all these messages, um, but uh, you've given me some good information. So if I can track down this contractor, I can make some phone calls to the, to the political organizations involved and, and maybe I can get the name of the company and send a uh, you know, certified letter re uh, insisting that I be removed and that they're messing up my life. Spend a couple of, well, it might not be a couple of bucks. Spend some money on your lawyer and have your lawyer write a registered letter on legal letterhead. They'll pay attention to that. I can't swear that they'll do what you ask them to do, but it's a lot more likely to get their attention. Thank you. Dead Leaf, uh, you did unmute yourself, so please go ahead with your question. Thanks. Uh, John, going back to what you said before, this is, uh, uh, this is super interesting. I have done what you had just suggested about blocking numbers because I get text messages and I get, uh, I get voice messages and it drives me up the wall because yep. my, su my supplier is actually Google. So I'm not using AT&T or Verizon. Um, isn't that number up on top a spoof number? Yes, but it, um, uh, well, I, I will say this. Um, political parties are a little less likely to use spoofing. The name, you know, when it says, hi, this is Carl, or this yeah, is Dana. Well, it's, you or, know, we, we want to take care of your car extended warranty. Oh, well, yeah, that's no, different. That's, that's not th that's not political. OK, when you get extended warranty offers and stuff like that, that's always spoofed. I mean, there there is no question. Those people are hiding as much as they can because they're really not. They're never going to offer you. Any real value, what they're simply trying to do is take your money and run. So does blocking that spoof number actually help? Or will they call me again and just use a different spoof number? I suspect they will call you again and use a different spoof number. Now, in terms of 
voicemail, the most effective thing you can do is the greeting with the sit tones at the beginning. And that will, no matter what spoof number they're using, that will convince the robocaller system not to contact you again, whether or not they are attempting to sell you an extended warranty or they are attempting to uh, get your social security number so that they can extract money out of your bank account or uh, attempt to convince you that your electric company is cutting off your electric service and you need to pay $500 immediately to restore the service. No matter what they're trying to do, the basic idea is for them to steal your money. And uh, the robocaller system probably has many different clients that use many different scams. But the advantage of that combined greeting is that it convinces the system that your number doesn't exist anymore. And when enough systems call and hear that greeting, as I said, as you saw in my statistics, the number of robocalls just decreases dramatically. And I recognize that for most of you working with recorded audio and working with applications like Audacity is brand new, but that's why I showed it to you step by step so that you can accomplish it. And I, I must say, um, although we've had a dramatic drop off in the number of attendees, we started with 50 and you're, to be honest, yours is one of the bigger clubs I've talked to, particularly on this topic. If there's somebody in your club who can master all of these steps, the thing to do is use that person as an expert at a physical meeting. People bring in their phones, that person's there with the computer and can do the whole thing from one end to the other as a service for other club members. And that's what, the what we really want is the uh, the Captain Crunch whistle solution, where we can just blow the whistle and they'll <laughs> hear the tones that they're supposed to hear. Well, Captain Crunch didn't play those tones. <laughs> Captain Crunch played another tone. It was another example of yeah. inept security management in the 1960s, um, and it uh, ended up playing. Um, a tone that disabled the security system so that uh, you became a super user on the switching server. Now, to give you an example of how, an extreme example of how you can use that, um, excuse me, I needed a little water. Um, I went to college at MIT in the 1970s. And the big mistake that AT&T did, they were hoping to encourage people to come to work for them engineers, top quality engineers from MIT. But how did they do that encouragement? They dropped the entire technical management manual for the SS7 switching system into the MIT engineering library. Can you imagine? It specified all the tones that you needed to know to take control of a switching server in SS7. I have one friend, a uh, classmate from MIT who had two landlines in his dorm room. And he managed to place a call from one landline heading east across the Atlantic, through Europe, through Asia, across the Pacific to reach his other phone on the other side of his room. And that line stayed open for 10 minutes until some security guy in one of those circuits, and there must have been at least 14 or 15 different companies involved. Um, and you can imagine some guy in Uzbekistan who just woke up and sees this call going through his system and just shaking his head. What in the world is this? So they kill it. But that's why it was only open for 10 minutes. Somebody broke the connection. Um, and to give you another illustration of just how insane that donation to the engineering library was, there's a payphone in a dorm for graduate students at MIT that typically produced in its, in its coin box 
maybe $2, $3 a year. But they had records to calls to Moscow. They had records of calls to Shanghai. And they didn't know how they got produced without people throwing any money into the coin box. Well, it's, again, because of this donation to the engineering library. Um, just by the way, the guy who placed that round the world call is now a fairly well-known lawyer in the District of Columbia. Uh, you remember when Bill Clinton was president, there was a woman named Linda Tripp who sort of blew the whistle on uh, Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Uh, he represented Linda Tripp uh, in defense of her job status uh, in the federal government uh, since uh, the Clintons tried to get her transferred to a do-nothing job. Um, or at least Bill Clinton tried to. Uh, at any rate, um, it's a small world sometimes. Uh, but Jim is a good friend of mine, and uh, I don't see him nearly as often as I should since they only live a few miles away from him. Uh, at any rate, uh, there's some amazing things that go on uh, to this day because of that donation to that um, engineering library. Uh, that was just you know, I just shake my head. Why do people do things like that? Well, like I said, they thought they were going to recruit people. No, that's not what happened. Um, any other questions? Mr. Hirsch, you have your hand up again. Uh, yes, sir. One, I forgot this earlier, but uh, another phenomenon with my uh, Android cell phone is occasionally a voicemail message will appear and I didn't get a phone call. So there's fun, they have found some way to electronically send voicemail messages to my phone. Is is there any way to prevent that? Or is that just something you got to deal with? Um, I have to admit, I've not heard of that before. Uh, so I can't really say without knowing how that happened, um, how to prevent it. I, I don't really have a clue. Uh, I'll be very interested to see if that ever happens on my phones, but I've had a smartphone now for 12 years, and I don't think I've ever seen that happen. That's very interesting. I'm I've sorry, I can't. That. I've gotten that sometimes, but it turned out that my phone somehow knows how to turn on the do not disturb by itself. Well, you know, when, now let me comment on that idea. Um, one of the things that's pretty well known about the way that we use phones, we tend to use consciously only the things that we understand really well. And the rest of it, we might hit a button by accident without knowing that we've, without consciously recognizing that we've done it. Now, clearly on iPhones, when you have a default schedule built in, somebody could turn on Do Not Disturb and not realize that they've done it. But that's a 24-hour, 24-7 Do Not Disturb schedule. Uh, on Android, if you, you know, somehow manage pushing buttons without really recognizing what you've done to turn on a schedule... Uh, it would only be effective from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. So it would be a call that came in during that time that would show up in your voicemail inbox without you recognizing it because the phone didn't ring. So those methods, which we do unconsciously by mistake, might make that happen. But I can't swear to it because I'm not looking over your shoulder while you're making those mistakes. I'm not looking over your shoulder at all. And let's be very grateful that there is no technique I can use to look over your shoulder without you knowing it. <laughs> I do have a question on text. On my Android with T-Mobile, I've been starting to get scads of text that are really graphically horrible. And I can only delete them. I don't have a block choice when I go into the into my text. Is there any way to get around that that you know of? Uh, that's another one I haven't heard of. Um, well, there's a few things. I mean, they're, they're kind of extreme. Okay, one is 
you can literally go to your phone company and ask them to assign you a different phone number. The problem with that is you have to call all your contacts and tell them or text them and, and tell them your new phone number. And that is why that option is what I'd call a nuclear option, because it, it causes a lot of grief. Um, the other thing you might do is talk to your phone company about it. And I'll tell you flat out, most, most of the phone companies don't really provide you anything other than an app. Like I mentioned, Verizon Wireless uh, call filter. And that's really designed for calls, not for text messages, not for emails. Um, and I'm not familiar with T-Mobile. Uh, I've been using, I, I mean, I've been on Verizon Wireless for uh, about 24 years at this point. And so I can't really give you any details on other phone companies. Uh, sure. but, but frankly, the phone companies have been dragging their feet. Now, the, the Federal Communications Commission, it didn't really create a mandate, but it created what, they may, what you might call strong encouragement. For phone companies, Verizon Wireless, AT&T, T-Mobile, whatever the other one was that you mentioned, to use a system that involves assigning digital certificates to every customer and would allow the phone companies to deliver calls to your phone only if the caller delivered a valid recognized certificate to the switching system. And this requires so much work for the phone companies to implement. And I might add, so much cost to purchase the hundreds of millions of certificates that are needed to accomplish this. The phone companies have been essentially shrugging and saying, we can't afford it. Um, given some of the problems you've described today, I think the phone companies better learn to afford it and frankly, if they go to companies like RSA that issues digital certificates and say, I'd like to buy 100 million, I think they'd get a pretty good discount. But I'll bet you they haven't asked. Um, just by the way, that whole technology, digital certificates, which are the fundamental method behind HTTP secure, what we use for making purchases on Amazon, dealing with our banks, dealing with our stock brokerages, among other things. That whole HTTP secure is based on the digital certificate technology that was developed by Ron Rivest and two other MIT professors. And they are, I think, the smartest people on earth that have never been recognized by the general public. I will grant that Elon Musk is in some ways a very smart man. Uh, I will grant that uh, some of the other professors, Musk is not a professor, but you've heard of this other one. Uh, if you've ever bought uh, Bose audio systems, that's from Professor Amar Bose at MIT. Uh, other people at MIT developed among other things, Campbell's Soup, um, if you've ever watched a movie in Technicolor, that was developed at MIT. Um, the man who developed the first practical memory for computers was a professor named Jay Forrester. Uh, he made a fortune off of that development. Um, I even took a course from the man who invented the strobe light. And believe me, as a photographer, I love strobe lights. Um, uh, his, uh, his name was Harold Edgerton, and he made a very substantial fortune off of that development. Uh, this is a very smart man, um, both in terms of the basic technology and how to make use of it in a practical way. Uh, er, just about every camera made in, in the world now has a strobe light built into it. Um, and, as uh, In cell phones, we had something similar, but it wasn't developed by him, uh, LEDs. Uh, that, and that's my plug for MIT. There we go. 
I right. have to mention, I was uh, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and not as many famous people, but uh, I think Goddard is well known in rocket development. So Yes, indeed. Robert Goddard. He's a sharp cookie, or he was. Uh, very, very, very intelligent man. Um, and uh, uh, I think almost every uh, long-lasting uh, technical education uh, university uh, has one or two or three people that come out of it. Um, one of the oddest little coincidences on this planet is that uh, after MIT, I went to graduate school at the University of Virginia. I was actually down there this morning. Uh, I went yesterday for uh, an alumni banquet. And as it turns out, the man who um, was briefly president of the University of Virginia and uh, chairman of the Natural Sciences Department in the 1830s was a man named William Barton Rogers. And uh, he was appointed the first state geologist of Virginia. And his job was to identify natural resources, meaning things like lumber and ores for you know, uh, useful metals like iron. So he sent survey teams all over Virginia. And in those days, prior to the, the uh, Civil War, Virginia included West Virginia. So it was a huge area to survey. Um, and later he left the University of Virginia and moved to Boston where he found a lot of support for his new ideas about technical education and founded a school called Boston Tech, which was many years later renamed MIT. So uh, that, that school and the University of Virginia have a very interesting connection. And I didn't know that when I started at Virginia, but I learned it years later. Um, so this has uh, been a big weekend for me uh, uh, as a way of connecting those two schools. Uh, it's, it was a lot of fun to see my old friends down there at Virginia. So any other questions? No? Okay, well, folks, it's been two hours. Um, I, I thank you for your attention and your very uh, intelligent questions. I wish I had more answers for you. But, uh, you know, these folks who try to pull off these scams, they never stop figuring out some new way to try to take something from you. So it's, it's up to each and every one of us to keep track of what's happening. Um, oh, I should look at, is there anything going on in chat that I need to look at? Let's see here. Um, okay, JJ Johnson said that last QR code took me to Amazon. Do you mean the one that was supposed to create an email? JJ, are you still on the, on the uh, meeting? Um, I guess not. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what he meant, but I'll double check all the QR codes before I send out the presentation. Um, I updated it last week. Uh, what I, <clears throat> a lesson for John, what I need to do when I put in each QR code is scan it with my phone and make sure it does what I think it does. So, uh, you know, that's because I don't have an editor that I can hand it over to and let them check it. But uh, I will uh, I will check them and make sure that we're cool. Um, OK, so uh, JJ also wrote another one. He says, I'm the founder of Lake County Area Computer Enthusiasts in Illinois. Um, and he would like to give that to the program chair for that outfit. Well, yeah, sure, JJ. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll look up the web page for your uh, site. And oh, you gave me your email address. Okay, so I can do that. I can um, uh, I can send that to you. Yeah, sure. Um, anything else, folks? I'm a little worn out. It took me three hours to get back here. There's another thing you might be interested in if you if you like to get exercise by hiking in the outdoors. Uh, there's a game I play called geocaching, and I do offer an introduction to geocaching presentation. Uh, I found six geocaches on the way back from Charlottesville to uh, Arlington, Virginia, where I live today. And I might add, it was drizzling the whole time, but a uh, little water never stopped me. Um, 
and it's made a big difference in my life. I've learned to enjoy hiking. Uh, I've uh, reduced my blood pressure. I've reduced my heart rate as a result of the hiking. So a nice outdoor hobby like that can really make a difference in your life. Um, so with that plug, I'm going to take off. Uh, I, I need some lunch. <laughs> well, let uh, me just thank you very much. It was extremely informative, well-prepared. I'm going to try the lo-fi first. Uh, I, I have a, a, a good amplified speaker system on one of my computers. So maybe that'll work to my phone and not have to go through the hardware expenses. But really, I think it was just wonderful. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time and the detail was just fantastic. So thank you. Well, I, I will say um, I developed it over a period of about 18 months, three different 30 minute presentations for my club. And I've expanded it a little since then. That business with the Sabrent uh, USB audio adapter cable that's brand new. It's never been, I've never included it in a presentation before, but it does add exactly what Apple and Samsung have removed from their phones. That socket for the headset uh, does a perfect job with that. Um, I also uh, uh, will recommend uh, taking a look at those uh, on the go cables because if, you're, if your computer ever fails, you can use the on-the-go cable and a uh, USB uh, hub to connect a, a keyboard, a mouse, and it's the most amazing thing when you hook up a mouse to your, to your phone and move it, all of a sudden there's a mouse pointer on your phone. Um, you can hook up using the same USB, you can hook up a USB to HDMI and then run an HDMI cable from that into your monitor. And all of a sudden you've got a complete substitute for a dead computer. And that's something that OTG can make available for you immediately. So um, on the go cables are tremendously valuable if you need your computer and it dies say at 11 o'clock at night, um, when you can't go out and buy another one, or for that matter, take it to a repair shop. You can't do that either, but you can use your phone as a substitute computer by use of that on the go cable. So that's the last little bit of preaching I'm gonna do, and I'll get out of your faces, folks. Have a good afternoon. Thanks very much, John. Wow. Quite an afternoon. Huey, quick comment. The Power Toys, I <laughs> downloaded it and it failed to load. But I was very impressed with that, uh, being able to cut and paste text out of there. Because like in the Tech for Senior, you, you can't, when, when Bob is making his presentation, there's a, a, a website you can't cut and paste out of Zoom. It won't let you. And, and the same thing with Facebook. And you demonstrated cutting and pasting out of Facebook. So that yep. really looked very useful. I see we have a raised hand from Timothy Keckers. Please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, offhand, uh, your comment regarding uh, uh, fail to install the power toys. A lot of times it's either the firewall or an AV program that's blocking it. I have a lot of stuff open in my computer right now. So yeah, <laughs> start I, it and try it again. Thank you. Mine, uh, it was a firewall. No. Well, I, I, I can check that too. Thank you. All right. Quite an afternoon. And uh, he, <laughs> he commented about me asking him to kind of reduce the time. He said it would be about two hours. And uh, I, I mentioned to him that there would be uh, we would be on for about an hour and a half before he started. So he he paid some attention to it, I guess. But all right, if there's no other comments, uh, don't forget um, Tech for Senior tomorrow. I, I'm not going to announce the board meeting, and there are still a few people from CFCS on, including no board members. It's not even worth mentioning. So have a great rest of your weekend, and thanks, Hall, for coming. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Stan, take care.
Please don't forget to stop the recording, Huey, and take care of that for us. And uh, I will 